All right, it is September the 24th, 2012. It's, um, we're getting close to election day. This is Thomas Keegan with libertarianprogressive.com. We're interviewing independent third party candidates who are running for the US Congress. Um, the House, the Senate, um, even have one interview with the governor, but we're gonna have up to 50 interviews by October the 6th. And, uh, and just to give you an example of who's out there who can be that alternative candidate that we never hear about, we always hear that there's a lesser of two evils, that, um, that uh, there's no one to vote for, but, but there is. Um, and, uh, and we're talking to such a person um, named Ben Easton, uh, running for district number 17 for the uh, U.S. House of Representatives uh, for Texas. And uh, he's running against Bill Flores, the Republican, doesn't look like there's even a Democrat in your district. And um, Bill um, voted for the NDAA. I mean, um, y you know, it it's it's like the tea in the Boston Harbor. It's got to go. It, we got to throw it out. And um, because uh, that's basically voting against the Constitution. It's voting for indefinite detention that uh, crosses the line. Um, plus, you know, many other issues. Uh, Republicans, Democrats have a 10 percent approval rating. And I mean, if there's a more opportunistic year, there hasn't been one yet. And uh, and, and just it's a vicious cycle. It's time to break out of it. Um, so, Ben, um, if you good afternoon, if you could tell us about the 17th district and also what motivated you to be in here and just maybe a little bit about yourself. Thanks, sir. Uh all right. Well, first of all, good afternoon or good morning, depending on when your listeners are tuning in. Yeah. My name is Ben Easton, and I'm, I appreciate your calling me up and holding this interview. It's a, a really good forum that you have here, and I'm happy to be a part of it. So uh, District 17, U.S. House uh, of Representatives, District 17 in Texas, is about a, tw well, it's got 12 counties in it in whole or in part. And it was part of the recent redistribution, or, or not redistribution, what redistricting, excuse me, and that uh, many of the national media uh, has, has made a big deal out of how Texans apparently have messed up their districting for various political reasons. And I don't doubt that. I mean, the, the Republicans and the Democrats are, are gerrymanderers both, depending on who needs to get back into into office in, in whichever election cycle that they were kicked out in the last time, you know, so mud slinging, et cetera. So in 2010, it was a pretty straightforward, logical swath of counties uh, going from a little bit north of Waco, Texas, down to uh, College Station, Bryan area. So it's got two big college campuses and a bunch of uh, nice towns and, and and smaller dis, you know, cities and uh, communities in between. And in the 2012 cycle, though, it looks not too much like that. I mean, it's got some of those same counties, but it's, it's pretty much a, a big splotch, but it's got a funny little, what I sort of think of as a snakehead, you know, sneaking over into the North Austin area. And I think of it as a, a serpent head or maybe even a pickpocket's hand uh, to to satisfy the gerrymanderer's intentions. So anyway, that's that's what District 17 looks like, uh, 12, 12 counties in whole or in part. Yeah, it's it's not just Texas. It's all across the country. It's all across, I've heard this all across the country that um, there's these gerrymander districts. They don't look like, you know, how counties look kind of nice, nice and like square shaped or whatever, geometric. I mean, these look like, you know, like they're just splatted with like a lava lamp and um, and and they just crawl into other places. I mean, it's really if, if that doesn't that's just another, um, you, you know, just another thing we're going to, you know, present to the jury here um, as uh, some more evidence of um, their, you know, gerrymandering ways. And um, so, uh, well, um, you know, I guess that's, you know, a part of America there and, and, and you have a chance to be in the uh, U.S. Congress. And um, now, um, uh, as far as issues go, um, let's talk about, uh, you have a good set of issues. Um, uh, a healthy set of issues, and one of them is, and let's just start out with this one, um, is um, education. And uh, I usually don't start out with education, but, um, but I mean, 
it, it was Thomas Jefferson who said, um, democracy demands an educated and informed electorate. And uh, so, um, and, and the media is supposed to play a part in that, um, but they, 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 they don't tell us about our alternative options. They don't want um, real American people, non-politicians in the debates. Uh, but um, that it doesn't have to matter because the media has a 17% approval rating. And, um, and all we need to do is, uh, you know, don't vote for the Republicans and Democrats. But um, Ben, um, yeah, tell us about, um, you know, please, I guess, educate us on um, education. Okay. Um, well, <clears throat> I think that one doesn't have to be in the education field to have strong opinions about it and strong beliefs. Um, I happen to have been a teacher, though, for 17 years. That was probably certainly my most significant career. Um, I got my start out when I lived out in Los Angeles, even though I'm basically a Texan. <clears throat> but uh, started off in uh, a small little private school, found out I really liked teaching but didn't have a credential, so I went and was a district intern in the Los Angeles Unified School District, a, a very large, uh, extremely large uh, bureaucracy of, of public school, government-run school system in a, in a very large city. And, you know, I, I saw, I, you know, basically it was, it was like being in the enemy trenches. So I, I saw firsthand that, that, by and large, the school system was full of, of good people, smart people, hardworking people, well-intentioned people, uh, but under the management and the administration of an impossible uh, lockstep kind of system, of so what I like to call Soviet bloc-style administration. And I came to Texas, came back to Texas back in the early 90s, <clears throat> and content, continued teaching, but in a private school, and. Uh, a free market school, as it were, um, even though it's it's not truly a free market school because the education of children and well, youth. Ben, instead is, of calling it a free market, how about just a free school? Yeah, I mean. Well, but I mean, like, free, well, not free, like as far as the cost, but I just mean, you know, free to do, you know, educate in uh, different ways that um, that uh, you know the instructors find appropriate. Well, that would, that would be good. I would just, I mean, because words and sound bites can be twisted, I would, you would have to add what you just did. So I, I like to think of it as basically the government-run school system that we have that is, that is in charge of educating, oh, at least 60%, if not 80 or 85% of all students uh, at, at any level in the United States of America. And... Uh, and then the so-called private school system, which is still beholden to that public school, that, that government-run shield or blanket or umbrella, uh, wet blanket, I'd like to think, is because it, it massively skews all the decisions throughout the whole, you know, the whole nation. And you know, from, from textbook uh, writing and, and uh, contracts where certain states and certain uh, communities seem to have the, the, the lock step or, or the lock on that, uh, which textbooks get, get uh, taken and, and uh, sort of hired for the next year, the next couple of years. And that, that leads to just a very uh, pervasive dumbing down of America. I mean, we see it in, in, every, in, in so many ways throughout all the media. It, it's almost impossible to to even describe it, and in, in certainly in a 30-minute interview. Oh, totally. I mean, there isn't just one biography of Teddy Roosevelt. Um, there isn't just one book of history on, um, on, on loads of subjects. I mean, sometimes in history, there's lots of books on that particular era, and, and just to get one, you, you know, um, well, vantage point of it is uh, really, um, you know, not seeing the big picture, being short no, no, so so, Thomas, let me give you a very quick little vignette. Um, uh, literally 20 minutes ago, I was eating lunch uh, downtown here in Austin at, at Whole Foods, the Whole Foods, you know, world headquarters, and and uh, I was sitting at the community table. I was talking to a really nice mother and daughter that were down visiting from Buffalo, New York, down here for a wedding. So we were talking about various things, and, and my campaign came up. And, and b b before I even told them that I was running for office, we were already in pretty good deep conversation about 
Obamacare, about education, about that recent Chicago teacher strike. And I said, you know, and because, and because her, her son and fiance, his fiance, are teachers, and I was asking, well, where will they go teach? And she said, well, not up in Buffalo. We're, you know, we're having, teachers are having a hard time. And, and they spend $23,000 per student per year. Now, I found that, I found that uh, value or that, that number hard to accept. So I, I didn't go research it. Literally, this was a 30-minute-ago conversation. But <clears throat> well, they should have like awesome, awesome. Like they should, they should be like like in a school that you'd picture like Atlantis having or something. You know? Yes, yes. So, so I mean, I, as a teacher, I mean, I could literally take four students and and teach them not one on one, but four on one, and be be sort of the private mobile yeah. teacher, sort of like Aristotle to Alex. Oh, Alec. my God, yeah, you could totally, that would be, who could argue could against them, that? I could give them fabulous education, you know, and team up with other small little groups and, and serve them up proper. But, but the point is that they aren't getting that. The, the, the students are, I, these people said that the kids were at a very low success rate, just like in so many other cities and communities. So it, it, it's just, it's massively more expensive than it needs to be. There are issues, like just take prayer in school. Prayer on the football field or in school or before, you know, that all would immediately become a moot point if education were privatized. Because for those parents uh, who want to send their kids to a school where there's a serious religious overtone and, and daily prayer, um, that, that's fine. They get to do that. They get to, they get to create a school or find a school, <clears throat> whether it's a Catholic school or a or a Jewish school, or, or even a Muslim school, and they get to pray their heads off, and th there's no problem. Whereas people who want to send their kids to a non-denominational school or a secular school, a, a, a science academy, for instance, um, they don't they don't need to offer prayer, and and there's no there's no conflict of interest. Well, I've seen so, some really interesting <clears throat> schools, like out in Oregon, where you, you know some of them, you know, they have the kids outside more. Some of them. They have like where they um, uh, you, they kind of set their own like they kind of hint towards their own course you, you know and and, and and then they then then I guess the teachers would just back that up with a lot more details and, and knowledge about that subject but uh, they kind of let the kids kind of guide what they you know instinctively want to learn and there's so many different kinds of education to put it all in a box is completely ridiculous I mean it's um, anti-education it, it, it's it's uh, <coughs> propagandizing um, but what about like a lot of it's spent at the local level and um, and those kids seem to react really well with it, from what I saw on there. But, um, but it's it's you know a lot of it's done with property taxes. I mean, would you provide vouchers? Are you saying vouchers for the poor is better, or do you think that just government completely out of it would, you know, just bring the prices down, or or what, what you know what would you do? what about the poor in education? Well, my what I'd like to do just because I literally came from a, a large market. Um, uh, I, I like to use the grocery store or, or supermarket metaphor for many of my political arguments, not just for education, but it certainly works well here, I believe. It's like, you know, on the cereal aisle at any of the large supermarket chains, there are literally, you know, a hundred types of cereal. Or in the coffee or tea or, or, or soft drinks, you know, there are tens and hundreds of choices. And I imagine, and then there are also the, you know, the large bins where I could, if I don't want box cereal, I can go get um, 18 or 20 or 30 varieties of granola and pure this, you know, and I can mix them. I can, I can make me hungry that. now. <laughs> yeah. so, so I can literally see that this is the model for education. Now, what would all those different uh, things stand for? I mean, how would you go to, a, to an education supermarket and find and and all I, all I can say right now in this brief interview is that in a supermarket mentality, a free market, the entrepreneurs and the creative people like myself, or like, at least like I used to be, I've, I've moved on and I'm, I have a different career now. But you know, I, I still know many of my best friends are teachers and administrators, uh, and and they work in that field of education, and. So many of them could come up with their own plans, whether they're vocational schools, uh, K through 12 academic powerhouses, um, 
you know, remedial schools. I mean, there, there are, it's, it's a limitless number of mixes and matches that could be done if the free market were really allowed to exist in the world of education, and the cost would be massively lower than it is now because it wouldn't, it wouldn't require literally three, if not five or eight levels of, of state and federal level. I, I hear you, and the and quality, gentlemen. most importantly, the quality, it, it just as importantly, quality would be um, a lot better as well. And, I mean, so <clears throat> the way I see it is sending someone in Congress that, can analyze in their minds um, that hey, we're paying um, you know twenty three thousand dollars per student, and um, look, um, it just rationalizing, just a quick thought here. I mean, you could have one teacher per student at that rate and have fabulous education. Um, you know, so I mean, a lot of people just aren't even able to you know, think in that kind of way, and um, and that's why we have this built upon built, um, uh, be, you know, this like, you know, Soviet um, uh, bureaucratic uh, education system that we have. Um, and uh, so, I mean, just even be, you know, someone who has a passion for it, who has, you know, wants to explore all these different ideas, be open to it, have honest debate. That's what real education is about. It's a lifelong thing anyways, and you've got to be self-motivated after certain points. And you know, that sounds excellent, Ben. I mean, that's what we need. That is how we could maybe have, like, some kind of, you, you know, super education system. I, I mean, you know, that would be more, you know, Atlantis-like to sound corny here. But you also mentioned... Um, uh, campaign finance, um, and I think, um, you, you know, there definitely seems like there's a cartel called the Republicans and the Democrats, and so how can we open the floodgates of, uh, y you know, democracy for this republic, sir? <clears throat> well, that's the, that's the big question for, for, the, for us libertarians and progressives, and it's, it's, been, uh, it's been frustrating over the years to see the media uh, and, and media is a plural. It, it stands for all the, the, the outlets of communication and, and news organizations. And so I, 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 want, you know, I want to first point out that I know I'm using a very broad term when I say media, and, and then I can say mainstream media. I, nevertheless, I think that it is a truism, and it's even, could, it's even admitted by those in the media that the, in the mainstream media that, that they are skewed and that they, they tend to take on the flavor of the camps who run them and own them. And that, that's a human thing, too. So what I'm getting at is that the media, the mainstream media, have effectively tried to lock out and block and censor and make invisible the Libertarian Party, to a lesser degree the Green Party, and other, other quote, third parties. So it is a, uh, a, a, a by, what, God, I saw it, the term today, a, du, a duopoly of the Democrats and the Republicans, and they, you know, they, they fight at each other, and they, it's, a, it's a cat fight and a dog fight, but they are basically happy as long as the, the pendulum gets to flip-flop back and forth between, quote, the two sides of the aisle. And there ain't no room for any third parties. So we libertarians, which, in you know, my opinion, have clearly the best views, the freshest, you know, outlooks, the, the best solutions, we are locked out. It's the old tick-tock, the game is locked, swallow the key mentality that, you know, that I learned as a kid playing Red Rover on the park or in the park. So, you know, the, the Greens aren't welcome the libertarians aren't welcome. Certainly, the you know other American Socialist Party or whoever they are aren't welcome. And what the what the Democrats and the Republicans do to minimize our import and and the fact that we do have very specific identities and agendas is that they just refer to all of us as independents. And they even try to say, they even try to refer to it as the, the independent party. But there isn't any independent yes. party. There are several other parties beyond the two large what I call machine parties. And so, so I wanted to jump real quick into what you were saying, though, about campaign reform. And uh, my campaign is, uh, is, is very low-key by, by any standards. Um, you know, the odds that I'll win against the Republican incumbent, uh, Bill Flores, are very small. They're, they're, that's obvious. So to try to say anything different, I, I would be an idiot. So nevertheless, even if I had, you know, 20 or 50 people you know, coming forward and offering to write me checks 
out of their checkbook. And I didn't, I didn't have that. In fact, I had about, I've had probably five people say, hey, let me, let me write you a check. Let me contribute because I haven't even solicited donations. And in fact, those, those five people, um, I told them, no, no, thank you. I, I literally don't want your donation. What I'm doing in my campaign is I'm running the way I would like to see all campaigns run, and that is to extremely cheaply, that is inexpensively. Um, I'm, I'm responsible. I answer every survey and questionnaire that comes my way. I, I jump at the chance to have interviews like this. This interview, yeah. And, and, uh, but I'm, I'm literally spending you know, roughly $1,000, give or take, of my own money, and I'm willing to do that. I can afford to do that barely. Um, but I don't want other people spending money on me because I think that if all politicians, all candidates did what I'm doing, we would have a massively more even playing field. We would have a, a, a clearer landscape, you know, no more yard signs and billboards and all that, you know, TV ads and all that crap. What we would have is some, some newspaper articles. We'd have, we'd have some, there would be some TV spots, they would be, but they would be sponsored by the mainstream media doing, its, you know, doing their job as bringing new and fresh ideas to the American populace. And we wouldn't be taking matching funds like the Democrats and the Republicans do. We wouldn't be spending just absurd and appalling amounts of money to get into office so that we could then hold on to that office and, and flex our power, prestige, and, and influence on others, promising the, the constituents things that we can't possibly follow through on and, and that are literally unconstitutional. So that's my campaign reform is, you know what, I'm spending my money, and if I, if I don't get elected, that's, that's fine. I'll, I'll live, I'll survive, and, you know, I'll be back in two years. Well, so that's, that's pretty much my, my view of campaign reform. <laughs> and and people should be able to just you know go on the internet or go to the library and go on the internet and 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 just research who they want to vote for and see the list of issues. I think maybe I just saw this other day. I, I don't think it's practical, but I mean maybe on the ballot each candidate should be able to have like a, a paragraph amount where they can list the issues that they'd vote for, you, you know, and um and be right there on the ballot. I mean, uh, there. I also think. I mean. Um, that, uh, you know, people, I, I know you're not asking for donations, and a lot of people aren't. I, I don't think it's really necessary nowadays if five people tell us five people, and if there's a sentiment in this country, and um, right now Congress has a 10% approval rating, eventually, um, like, like the thief in the night, I mean, the American people are going to uh, elect a larger number in the Congress as possible. We're going to have 50 interviews at libertarianprogressive.com, but there's, um, out of the 500 or 435 members in Congress, about 70% of them do have a libertarian, a Green Party, an independent candidate that's not a Republican or Democrat, someone who is going to keep their oath, who's going to talk about and um, fight for issues like civil liberties, like, um, you, you know, a fair trial, uh, due process, um, you, you know, the Patriot Act, the NDAA, um, these, uh, you know, being an empire versus being a republic, um, you, you know, uh, more issues about um, foreign trade and, and just our tax system and uh, and just b basically the drug war. I mean, just these big issues that affect lives that are a matter of, you know, being incarcerated or not, which we have the highest incarceration rate. Those are things you're not going to hear about. You're not going to hear about incarceration rates from, you know, Obamni. You're not going to hear about, um, you know, drug war and uh, and just all, all alternatives for, for things um, and, and uh, just the bailouts. No one on the left or the right, that's why Occupy Wall Street was created and that's why the Tea Party was created, was those trillions of dollars in bailouts that we did in 2008 and beyond. And it's just getting crazy. I mean, we cannot continue to borrow 43 cents out of every dollar. And uh, so I would say, you know, contribute. I, I mean, contribute in time and money. I mean, it doesn't matter what district he's in. We're trying to send as many people to the House as possible. And, um, and uh, so, I mean, continuing on the issues, I mean, what about civil liberties? What about the drug war? Um, what about, um, also I'll just throw in there uh, abortion because, you know, some people want to hear that. And uh, so the drug war, 
the civil liberties, the state of the union on our civil liberties, and, and, and you know, what you think about the Constitution, and um, also abortion, sir. Okay. <laughs> so let's see how quickly I can, I yeah. can hit those all very good, juicy, and important topics. So let's see. First of all, the drug war is absurd. You know, I actually, when I went to school, I learned about uh, the very, fairly interesting chapter, and even a lot of my fairly boring history classes, I do remember kind of perking up and listening to the, the bit about prohibition. Like, that was pretty, pretty colorful stuff. You know, the mafia basically got imported to North America because of that. They saw a giant opportunity to make millions of dollars because, for some bizarre reason, the Americans decided to uh, prohibit the sale and use uh, basically, and, and selling and interstate trade and all that kind of crap for, uh, of alcohol. So you got your bootleggers, you got your gangsters, you got a whole culture that grew up around that, and, it, and it's the one issue that's involved two amendments out of the 25 or 6 or what, whatever we have. It was the 18th Amendment that abolished it all and, or prohibited it, and then the 21st was, oops, we made a giant mistake. Sorry. So... What amazes me is that, is that North Americans, and particularly those that l appear to live in the District of Columbia in Washington, they, didn't, they must not have been there in school on that day. They, they didn't get the lesson of prohibition. They don't get that, that marijuana, not just medical marijuana, but marijuana period, and cocaine and heroin and other, you know, mind-altering dr drugs, recreational drugs or not, should be legal to, to people of majority, in other words, to adults. We, you know, I happen to know personally and, and, and very uh, specifically how destructive alcohol can be. I have friends and family who have abused alcohol. You know, I don't think any of them have killed people, but they've, they've gone to jail, they've had DWIs, they've cause damage and run into other people, or not people, yeah, but cars. Yeah, and that required an amendment to the <clears throat> Constitution to prohibit it, too, unlike... Well, America. right, right, right. So anyway, I guess I'm, I'm stretching this up, but the point is, if we treated other drugs, and certainly alcohol is a drug, it's the first and main drug of all time in, in, in human civilization, to my knowledge, you know, the, the pressing of grapes and stuff, but uh, if we treated those other drugs as we treat alcohol, then that's all really all I'm asking is, is consistency. We immediately take the, uh, much of the allure away. The black market goes out of existence. The, the drug lords don't have any reason to be lords over their little, uh, you know, dominions down there south of the border or across the Yeah, the let's border. hurt their business. I, I, I'm be happy to hurt their business, you know. So, so anyway, you know, you, you, you legalize it or re-legalize it, and it becomes you know, above board, uh, it becomes taxable, it becomes basically civilized, and, and the craziness and the, the certainly the fast and furious stupidity at the border goes away. So that, that, that's the drug war, is, is basically end it and, and, and realize that we've already had that lesson in school, 18th Amendment, 21st Amendment, look it up and just act accordingly. Um, in terms of abortion, uh, I happen to be, you know, you could describe me as a pro-choice uh, libertarian. Now, that doesn't mean that I believe abortion is great. Let's just go get women pregnant and then just get, let's go have, a, you know, an abortion party. That, that's absurd. I, I think abortion is a very uh, serious choice to have, not just for the woman, but for, for the man who certainly was involved, okay? So, you know, the, the men and women uh, who who need to occasionally make a very tough choice for, for reasons that we can't even possibly go into now, um, need to occasionally make that choice. And I believe it needs to stay on the, on the table of options, okay? Now, all of the doctors and the specialists out there that say that we should, if we ever were to do it, we should certainly do it early and not wait until the fetus has mostly formed. And, and that's, that's all pretty obvious and makes great sense to me. But... Basically, I believe that, that abortion certainly needs to stay a legal option, uh, especially under, obviously, cases under, you know, medical situations, rape, and, and just other, you know, very, I don't know, I'll just call them serious reasons. I don't even know what they are. 
Right. Uh, no, that's uh, uh, you know very um, a sincere answer, sir. And uh, just real quick in closing, just what about uh, you know um, Empire versus Republic um, and uh, civil liberties? And, and ah. if you could throw in there, um, you, you know, who someone you've been um, you know thinking about recently, and 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 why you know that's a person of interest. Thanks. Okay. Um, let's see. So. So certainly, the, 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 on civil liberties, um, it does very much concern me and, and distresses me when I hear about you know, the ongoing Patriot Act and how that, that is spreading, the, the NDAA, which, ha which has to do roughly with the way the administration can, can uh, detain and, and, and imprison people or hold them and and it's unconstitutional and put, and, yeah. right and, and put influence on them without due process it it, it should be repealed period the, the patriot act should be repealed period in terms of foreign policy and military i am proud of america as a republic i believe all of our empire building and police state actions around the globe are absurd they're 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 monstrously expensive they, they do contribute fundamentally to the animosity that the United States um, is experiencing daily from not just the Muslim countries over there in the Middle East and, and Arabia and, and all that, but, but uh, in, in other continents as well. I mean, I, I, I think Australians and New Zealanders probably could, could say, you know, they, they, they don't necessarily like the way America is puffing around and, and police stating itself all over the place in 183 different foreign bases and and the same in Canada and Mexico and Japan and Korea so I believe that we should withdraw all foreign forces uh, military forces um, and it would take a while we couldn't do it in, in one week or one month but over the period of the next couple of years I could see us truly withdrawing all of those forces and immediately returning the United States to a to you know a more popular if, if not neutral maybe once again a popular respectable nation and not the dread empire that has come to, to stick its big nose into other nations' businesses. Yeah, and so. it might actually motivate other countries <clears throat> to, um, you, you know, start to fight for their own freedoms. And, um, and, and it might, yeah, like, like you said, it might make the freedom movement around the world a, a little more popular and, and we can still, you know, influence you know we can actually we could double down on the the battle of ideas um instead and uh um so yeah well, what about um uh, you know his people you've been thinking about that have been on your mind recently um and, and why you, you know are those people uh you know people you've been why thinking about a, yeah well i mean i guess i guess i guess what you might be getting at just because this is a political discussion is you know maybe people that have inspired me or people that right, I'm impressed right. with. So, so certainly in the, in the political realm, uh, Doctor No, <laughs> the uh, the uh, wonderful congressman from uh, Beaumont area, Houston, you know East Texas, Ron Paul mm -hmm. is a, a big inspiration. He's fantastic. He's he's consistent. He's he hasn't changed. He's spoken the truth for 30 plus years. So he's he's awesome. Um, I love uh, his son to a lesser degree. I, you know, I, he still needs to prove himself, but, but certainly Ron Paul, Dr. Paul, uh, Gary Johnson, the libertarian presidential candidate, is awesome. I met him a couple of weeks ago when he swung through the, the uh, Austin area, and uh, I, I spoke with him for several minutes, and I've read up on him, and I think he's fantastic. He is the real thing. He is a genuinely good, solid, just a you know, regular guy with with a and a real sharp mind and a true you know true true level of integrity that is equivalent to to Ron Paul. So I'm very excited about Gary Johnson. Uh, you know, in this election and and it, it would how wonderful it would be if the mainstream media would cover him in in something. Oh yeah, Gary Johnson is a uh, credible candidate. Um, I was watching one of his interviews and um, and speeches yesterday, and I, I mean I definitely want to go in the, um, you know, the uh, reality where he gets elected and, and you get elected. And, and that's, that's we're just saying this is a possible reality, people. Um, I mean, uh, it, peace and prosperity is, and, and uh, real accountability, um, you know, the only way to hold these people accountable is um, right now. Um, I mean, if we all don't vote, they're still going to be in charge. So, unfortunately, right now, the, the best way is, or fortunately for some, is that um, you, you know to uh, express yourselves 
through your your votes and and convince other people um y you know the uh different options that are out there and uh so is there anything that we left out um ben and uh also um you you know what what's what's next is do, are you going to be in a debate with this uh character um uh, that's running against you sir um uh, no i don't i don't think so you know by uh, we and bill yeah bill flores yes uh so no, I don't. I don't think that there is there is any debate uh, on the table out there. Um, my my next step is to is to just continue to. Wait, would you uh, be willing to have one if there? Oh, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. I'm I, I'm ready to go on national television, or just sit down in the local coffee shop with with no cameras. I'm ready to to talk at any level with with. Bill Flores so that's on the record. Else. You're willing to have a debate. There's only two candidates in this um, election. I mean, this is a real issue. I mean, I would put that on every, uh, you, you know, poster or whatever. I mean, anyone who's hiding from a debate, they, they must be scared. Um, they must be scared of, you know, Congress as a whole 10 percent approval rating and um so i mean yeah i would keep challenging him out there and his no is uh an answer in itself that's a good point that's a good point so really you know i'm going to continue doing what i'm doing and granted it's it's a a relative to the sort of status quo of campaigning it's, it's low low level or low key but my passion is high my beliefs are pure and and uh and i'm and I'm going to keep on doing what I'm doing and just telling the truth at every opportunity. Yeah, it, I mean, it, no one knows what's going to happen till the day after the, you know, the real polls are, you know, the final counts. And um, you never know. I mean, the mood might be there this year. Um, again, it hasn't been a, a better year. And so it is uh, Ben Easton, B E N E. A S T O N two zero one two two thousand twelve dot com and um, well Ben I, I mean it's 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 either voting for someone who's um, you know expressed these views who's willing to go on a debate um, and debate these issues against their opponents or someone who um, has voted uh, against your best interests and um, and 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 and, and it seems like is shying away from a debate so I mean what's the choice going to be? Uh, ben, I'll say goodbye to you um, after the uh, interview here, and thanks for your time today, sir, and, uh, you know, much success this November 6th, and I hope you have a good afternoon. Thomas, thank you very much for having me, and I just, I leave you all with uh, my little slogan. I basically uh, urge the listeners to wake up, smell the coffee, vote libertarian. Thank you.